Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. So glad you've joined us. Uh, just a reminder, you can always go to goodlifetelevision.org, which is where all of our interviews are. So all the long form interviews uh, are goodlifetelevision.org. So we'd love to have you join us there. But thanks for joining us today. I'm, I'm so glad uh, to have my, my guests with me today. Actually, guests. Uh, Sam Dudley's with me. Sam is a firefighter for Santa Barbara County. And this is Rhonda. <laughs> I'm trying to make sure she's comfortable. I think she is. I, I wish I could lay down. Uh, girl. So Sam and Rhonda are with me. Sam, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it just so happens that we're filming this on September 11th. Yeah. And so I wanted to start there. Just, you know, I, I woke up this morning to social media and the pictures. And one picture I saw was a firefighter looking up at the towers yeah. about to go in, never to come out. Yeah. And I, I, I wanted to just, you know, I mean, number one, thank you. Your profession, you're the guys that go in yeah. when everybody else is coming out. And it's such a noble profession that I wanted to make sure we honor you and all of your colleagues because it's special. And so, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank yeah. you very much. And, and you, did you, when did you decide to do this? I know you were with the U.S. Forest Service at the Los Padres National Forest for seven years before coming to Santa Barbara. Well, when did you decide to, to go into this? Well, I would say 9-11 um, was, I, I think, uh, was, was part of it. I remember it vividly, um, like most of us. I remember lying in bed. Um, I fell asleep with the TV on, and my mom woke me up. And I remember seeing it and just being sh like in shock, Shaken, in yeah. utter shock, you know, yeah. like, like all of us. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and my mom's from New York. So, and I remember going to the World Trade Center when I was a kid and my mom took me there. And so I think that was part of it. And, and, you know, the outcome and after everything happened. And like you said, many of those firefighters and now like with the training I've had, I know went into that building thinking that there was a distinct possibility that they're not coming back out. Yeah. And that was so inspiring for me yeah. to have that selflessness, to have that willing to give back, that wanting to give back to the community. And that really stuck with me ever since. Yeah. It's such a, I mean, there's a scripture that, you know, no greater love than to lay down your life for one's friends. Not a lot of us get the opportunity to yeah. do that. I mean, you know, hardly anybody. But this profession, it's actually real. I mean, you don't yeah. know when you wake up in the morning what you're going to face. Right. Uh, we were talking before we came on. This neighborhood where we're filming was affected by the mudslides. So walk us through that day because I know you uh, rescued a two-year-old, weren't able to rescue a 10-year-old who was already deceased. But but walk us through that day and what, what happened. Well, I remember... So this is kind of the part that, as a firefighter, that you have to, to find that balance. And I remember the night before, there was the warnings. My house was in the evacuation zone uh, the, the day before the, the mudslide happened. And I remember my wife and I having discussion. I remember her saying, I want you here with us. And I said, and we had a, we had a good conversation, and we got to the agreement that, you know, I have an obligation to this community to um, to show up to work and, and it made perfect sense. So we, we made arrangements for her. She ended up staying in a hotel. We were out of the house. And I remember that day um, thinking it was a normal day, um, seeing if this rain or this, this threat was gonna happen. And then I remember at the station at night, the heavy rain and then tones start going. And uh, each tone is associated with one piece of equipment and the tones were endless, tone after tone after tone. And I remember the station I was at at the time was on Calle Real, and we pulled out, we could see the glow from the fire from Goleta. And I remember it just pouring rain, and then on our computer it tells us what calls are coming in, and there was a list of water rescues. So we knew something, something substantial had happened, whether it was a flood or something, but people were trapped in water. When we showed up, or as we were approaching Montecito, we had a battalion chief in front of us. And I remember him saying, get off the freeway now, get off the freeway now, because the water had just then ah, come onto the 101. 
we then made our made our way up um, up Olive Mill and trying to get access um, up to 192 over to the fire. Eventually, we ended up um, coming up Olive Mill over. Actually, went up Hot Springs and then came across Mesa down into Olive Mill, and then. Um, that's where we kind of engaged and that's where we started seeing people started seeing the destruction um, and I remember my captain he got out at one point and this is before we really saw anything he said he turned back and I'll never forget it he turned back and looked at me and said guys there's driveways with no homes um, something major has happened and then I remember thinking we're south of 192 <laughs> you know right evacuation was north of 192 so then it started to all come together for me that this is major. And then coming down here and then, yeah, that's when we, we bumped into some civilians, made our way over. Um, a civilian had mentioned that there was um, a mother with two children um, and that they were unaccounted for. We made our way across and we heard a faint uh, cry, muffled. And when we made our way over, um, we heard it louder and louder, and it was so hard to hear because all the gas mains were broken. So there was just this constant hissing and bubbling from underneath the mud. Um, radio traffic was nonstop, and eventually, I mean, absolute miracle that this kid was found um, alive and able to cry for us to hear him. I mean, the fact that all of it happened was really the fact that we bumped into a civilian, the fact that he said, go this way. Yeah. You know, we, we have our tactics of how we search for people in these types of situation and, and they worked and we found someone and we rescued them. Wow. Um, so that was a really proud moment and we were finding more and more people that were alive and everything was, was going great. And then, um, as the rain stopped, as the sun came out and as the mud levels lowered, that's when we started to find, deceased people yeah and that's when it again sunk in on a different level you know we, we were being you know I hate to use the word but we were being heroic you know we were saving people we were pulling people right, out right, we right. were the first face that people saw after this horrible disaster but then the other side of a disaster yeah started to show it show its face yeah of death and destruction and wow yeah and that two-year-old yeah. Was it the brother of the 10 year old? Yeah. So he passed. The yeah. two year old lived. Two -year -old Do you lived. know the family? I mean, are you. Have yeah. You I, so I know who the family is. I haven't, um, you know, met them or. Yeah. Um, when we found the two year old, it was it was uh, a, a captain, Dustin McKibben, Captain Brian Fernandez, myself, um, Sky Bonillo, Brian Talbot. All of us kind of worked together to pull the debris off. Um, but yeah, the 10 year old later was, was me, another captain and a, and a now engineer. Yeah. But no, we, we didn't know at the time that they were related. Obviously it yeah. was later when pictures started showing up and names that we made the connection. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, that, uh, not knowing, I mean, I just think it's so interesting and, and especially around here recently, yeah. I mean, as we speak, I mean, the, not this part of the state, but a lot of the state is battling fires. Yeah. I mean, it just seems like the it's one wave after another of yeah. something I yeah. mean, around here. Yep. I mean, you guys, I mean, you never know. I mean, I know there was another fire out um, Goleta or up on the hill coming down six months ago or yeah. something. And, you know, so you guys are, you never know what you're signing up for yeah. in the morning. Yep. I mean, it's new every day. It's new every day, yeah. The, the job really is dynamic, to say the least. Um, but that's part of the excitement, that's part of the thrill, is not knowing what the day is going to bring. Um, I think a lot of us get into that, this, this line of work for that reason. Yeah. We enjoy it. We enjoy the surprise. But we also enjoy training for it, for yeah. all the different right. things that could happen. We really enjoy that. Yeah. So preparing is fun and then when it happens we get to use the tools that we worked really hard to sharpen yeah so it's, it's and fun. when you show up i mean people are in desperate situations yeah oftentimes mm -hmm. which when they see 
your face, you know, your friends. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's something about that that's just amazing to me. But, um, and I, and I, one of the things before we get to Rhonda, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, one of the things that, uh, that I wanted to mention that I hope comes through in this interview is I really hope young people take a look at professions like yours. Mm -hmm. Uh, because these are noble professions, whether it's law enforcement, firefighting. I mean, these are public service, noble professions that we, uh, you know, I really want to encourage young people to look yeah. at because it, it's a, it's a, uh, noble's the best word. It's a noble thing to do with your life. So, yeah, you know, I, uh, I couldn't agree more. It, yeah. The job is so rewarding, um, not only to, for ourselves, but for my kids right. and, and my wife and um, my whole family, you know, my family's yeah. so proud of me. Right. And I'm proud of myself and I worked really hard to get here. This yeah. job isn't easy to get. Right. Um, but I think that the other great part, besides it being a great way to give back to your community and as you said, a very noble profession, the part that I enjoy most is you're part of a team. Right. And I've been part of a team since I was born. I have three older brothers and I played sports up until I got hired basically. And so if you like that team aspect and you like that working together to accomplish a goal, yeah. to showing up on who knows what right. and putting your minds together and coming up with a plan on how to make it better, right? it's a pretty special job. Yeah, <laughs> it really awesome. is. Yeah, and I didn't think about that, but that's really true. I mean, if you wanna, if you wanna grow up and have your kids think you're a hero yeah <laughs> that's one way to do it yeah because you are yeah and, and that's awesome i love that yeah let's talk about Rhonda. all right the star Rhonda. i wanted to ask you <laughs> <laughs> Rhonda, you with me okay she's a little distracted <laughs> uh Rhonda jo just joined the santa barbara county fire right. department she's an emotional support dog yep um, I read that she was actually trained in a prison. Yeah. <laughs> how did that work? The prisoners trained her. Yeah. How, yeah. how so, does that work? So Rhonda was um, rescued from a high kill shelter where they kill roughly 30 dogs a day. And there's an organization called Pause for Life Canine Rescue. Yeah. And they go to these high kill shelters and essentially repurpose these dogs. So they'll find some dogs that meet some basic criteria of being very mellow, loving, sweet dogs, and they put them through a training program at a couple state prisons in the state of California. So these prisoners, um, most of which are serving life in prison, are all under the same mentality that we're here forever, let's make the best of it, and let's do something to give back to the community that, that we let down. Wow. And that was... I went and visited the prison and that was the message that I got from them. Yeah. They wanted a second chance at an opportunity to help mankind. And so what they do is they take these dogs and they've, they've been through training themselves and they go through tons of different commands with them. They go through a basic obedience school and then they adopt, people can adopt these dogs. Once they finish the obedience school, if they feel the dog is special, like Rhonda, um, is very smart, learns quickly, very sensitive, very sweet, very loving, very calm, very calm, that they'll go through this service dog program, which is a little more strenuous, more commands, higher expectations. And um, the dog is assigned to a, a, a few prisoners and they work with the dog all day throughout the night. So the program prior, before we got Rhonda, what their number one goal was they would take these service dogs and they, veterans that were diagnosed with PTSD would be assigned a dog. So they would fill out a form. Um, they would have actually had to have been diagnosed with PTSD from a physician and they'd be able to get a dog. They go through a two week training program with the prisoner at the prison with the dog. Wow. And then once they finish, then they're able to take the dog home and they keep the you know, tool sharp. They do the training every day. So we reached out where I reached out to them and asked if if the fire department could could have one for um, for emotional support, and they were absolutely fired up on it, and uh, Rhonda did my, nine months hard time. <laughs> hard time. <laughs> she was in prison for nine months. She was in prison for nine months, but uh, she had a good time, and now she's now she's at the firehouse. That's amazing! What a win-win. So yeah. the prisoners train the dogs. Yeah. 
And then, so, and I read that the, uh, there were some donors that helped with this project. The yes. Wood Clayson's Foundation, yep. uh, the Manitou Fund. Yep. The Manitou Fund bought Rhonda a Ford F-150. Yeah. Yeah. That's her car. That's her vehicle. I so. have one of those. Rhonda and I. <laughs> yeah, Rhonda. She's got a Ford F-150. She Rhonda, does. do you like it? What color is it? It's white. 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 Just like our uh, our county equipment. Yeah. So so the cool thing about having the vehicle, the, the, the nice thing about having the vehicle is that Rhonda and I are available 24-7 for any of the fire department members. So if I'm at home, um, I get a phone call that a crew has been through a challenging call um, or if a crew member struggling uh, with something at home, yeah. whatever it may be, they can call my cell phone and the fire department, um, you know, Chief Hartwig um, is in full support of Rhonda and I getting in our, in our F-150 and driving to wherever this person is yeah. and, and working them through their issue. And she can tell, so she, can she pick up signals from somebody who's in distress or who's... Yes. Yeah. Okay, so she doesn't think I'm in distress right no, now. No, you're good. So I think, I think everyone here is relatively happy. She so. seems pretty relaxed. Yeah, she's relaxed. But no, it's pretty impressive. So um, I see it at work. Um, you know, there's individuals that are that have, you know, one time there was an indiv individual approaching retirement, and um, you could kind of tell, as the, the term is, their bucket was full. So meaning that, you know, in our careers, and you hear this term used a lot, we have a bucket. And after, a, after a, a stressful call or one that's really challenging, you know, maybe a cup or two gets poured into your bucket. Or if it was maybe kind of stress, stressful, a couple drops. But eventually, if you, don't, if you don't maintain, if you don't empty your bucket every once in a while, it's gonna fill up. Right. And um, so I think his bucket was right there. And all day, Rondo was in his lap. Really? And the captain later came up to me, he's like, that dog's incredible. Right. So I think, uh, That's you know, it's, it's really impressive to see her do it. Some of the, the training we do to keep it sharp is um, I'll, I'll put my head in my lap and pretend to cry and she'll come kiss me. Really? But I don't have to do it at home too much because my kids cry all the time. So <laughs> she just, she goes with them. <laughs> She's starting not to buy my son anymore. She's like, yeah, she knows he's <laughs> you're faking it. Playing her. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I want to talk about. The, the, again, back to your profession, but yeah. firefighters deal with PTSD and depression at five times the rate of the general population. Mm -hmm. And so I know there's a couple things I read about. One is Rhonda. Mm -hmm. uh, another is the At Ease Foundation, yes. which Mike McGrew is a dear friend. Yep. And um, how has the At Ease, in combination with Rhonda, changed the, the the dynamics with the stress that you guys face well you know and i and i saw it in my career and I, i've been with the county for five years so this is brand new um and i worked for the forest service for seven years before that but if you had an issue the way it, it was viewed as weakness right um and that's you know we're we're firefighters we're not we're yeah. not weak you know right um, but that's ridiculous. But you're not Superman. But we're not Superman. Right. No one is. Yeah. So after the debris flow, we had an all hands meeting. The entire Santa Barbara County Fire, Santa Barbara City Fire, all the local fire departments, every single personnel was at Earl Warren Showgrounds. And there was other agencies covering our stations. And we had um, uh, counselors there. We had a peer supporter there from Los Angeles County Fire Department, and it was 30 minutes of, this is all normal, guys. What you're going through is totally normal, and there's avenues to help you. It was like, everyone's here, and from that day forward, it's, it's not viewed as weakness. Right. It's, it's opposite, it's almost opposite. If, if, if you recognize, if your crew member recognize you have an issue, if you recognize you have an issue, it's almost like if you don't pick up the phone, what are you doing, man? Yeah, right. You know? Right. We need you. Yeah. Your family needs you. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's okay. So it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. So our peer support program, kind of grassroots program came from that. And what we do as peer supporters, I'm one of them, is we're the bridge between the individual and at ease. 
So if there's someone that's not quite ready to talk to a counselor, but they want to talk to a coworker that has some basic training, I can talk to the individual and then at the end of it go, hey man, pick up the phone. Yeah. I'll, I'm, I'm here with you. Rhonda's here with you. Right. Let's call them. Yeah. Let's just call them. Yeah. And I think having a bridge between that gap yeah. is is going to... And do they hopefully... most of the time do it? Oh, yeah. 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 Because yeah. it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that number is going to improve with with programs like At Ease. Yeah. Um, I think you're still going to have PTSD, but I think the recovery is going to be a lot better. Yeah. And, and at ease works with police also. Or is yep. it, yeah. So yeah, it's all it's all um, first responders in the tri counties. That and at ease's motto is we we don't, we don't say no. You know, if there's if there's a first responder that calls that needs help, you know, they're gonna help. Them. They're gonna help them. Yeah. You mentioned the kind of the team. I mean, it, it, I've always had the impression that the, that the firefighters and maybe the law enforcement. That there's kind of like a brotherhood, mm -hmm. sisterhood, yeah, uh, that exists. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that been your experience? Absolutely. I mean, where you kind of do anything for each other. Absolutely. Yeah. No yeah. hesitation. Yeah. It's, th th it's truly family. I mean, you know, I spend, you know, without any extra days or after shifts like we're working right now with all these fires happening, I spend a third of my life at the fire station. You know, for 30 years. So, you know, we're 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 not just coworkers. We're roommates. Right. We're, we're, you know, we cook dinner for each other. We help each other out when times are tough. We, uh, we poke fun at each other, you know, we, right. we do all the things that a family does. That's so true, it's yeah. absolutely a brotherhood, a sisterhood. It's a family. Yeah. It really is. How often are you all called like away to, if some, something's happening somewhere else in the state, how often do you guys go somewhere else? Is that every, every summer we're, we have like right now we have over 50 people gone oh really fires most of them have been so we had a strike team which is five of our brush trucks um staffed with three to four people um and they've we had uh typically we do two weeks but we can do up to three weeks most of them did three weeks we swapped crews so those guys came home the crews that replaced them they've been gone for almost 21 days so it we typically um you know this summer is very you know, it's a historical fire season, right. as they're saying. Um, but we norm we have people out all summer, ranging from five to fifty or sixty people. Wow. Yeah. Last question about kind of the firefighting yeah. side, because I've always I've wondered this. Yeah. I read an article yesterday. You know, who knows yeah. if it's true? But it was talking about with all these fires all over the state, about arson, mm. and about some kind of potentially coordinated plan. Um, I don't know, you probably don't know if that's true either, but yeah. but I, I was wondering, you know, about about that. Do you guys, or do you guys, or does the police, is there some mechanism in place for spotting, you know, in, in patrolling, patrolling in yeah. danger areas for arsonists? Yeah, so typically what we do, um, when there's uh, a higher fire threat, when they're in red flag warning or um, you know high temperatures, if it's predicted sundown or winds, the fire departments will upstaff. So we'll have additional fire engines aside from separate from our daily staffing, uh, water tenders, bulldozers, um, the, our hand crews. They're all available, and typically we'll be patrolling the foothills looking for fires, looking for arsonists, or, or, or really anything. But wow. um, it's just extra hands to, to keep an eye out. So for bad guys. Yeah. Yeah. For, or, yeah, or, or for fire. I, <laughs> yeah, or for fire. Yeah, because yeah, I've, I've always wondered that. I yeah. mean, I, I don't know if it's true or not, but yeah. but in today's world, 2020's been a ball, hasn't it? <laughs> we having fun yet? Yeah, right. <laughs> we, I'm having a good time right now. It's New Year's. Well, we are. We are. <laughs> I'm just waiting for New Year's Eve. Yeah. Can you imagine how great New Year's Eve is going to be oh this year? We can all turn the page. See up. you later. Good Lord. Yeah. Well, Sam, this is awesome. And yeah. Rhonda, thank you for your comments. Yes. It's been a pleasure. She's she's <laughs> she's she's one of the finer guests we've had. Yeah, she's a good no girl. No offense. <laughs> None taken. That's well, I understand. Uh, well, Sam, thanks for your service. <laughs> Absolutely. And thanks for coming on. Good life. It's thank awesome you. to hear from you. And thank you. Tell your friends. Thank you. And we'll. 
And it's awesome to meet Rhonda. Yes, Rhonda. Yeah. Good girl. <laughs> Great. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>